Hey everyone, it's Dr. Andrew Wolf here with Health Ed Solutions, and today's lesson is on basic chemistries and the anion gap, and it's part of a series on interpreting ABGs. Don't forget to visit us online at healthedsolutions.com for more free content. Now let's get started. Okay, so basic chemistry labs are known by multiple names. I've heard, of that, heard them called the basic metabolic profile or the BMP, the Chem 8 or the Chem 7. Um, it essentially looks like this. So we have a diagram here. And we have sodium concentration here. We have potassium here. We have chloride. And total CO2. And then we have BUN and creatinine, and finally we have glucose, and that this would be a chem 7, a chem 8 would add calcium. Okay, so I'm just going to no fill in some normal values here, and these are all in milliequivalents per liter, except where shown otherwise. So sodium, the normal value is 135 to 145. Potassium, the normal value is around 3.5 to 5 or 5.5 or 5.2. I've seen multiple um, ranges depending on which um, hospital system you're working in, etc. Um, chloride, the normal value is 98 to 106 milliequivalents per liter. Total CO2 is 23 to 28 milliequivalents per liter. BUN is 8 to 20, and actually this is in grams per deciliter, and creatinine is 0 0.6 to around 1.3 milliequivalents per liter, and glucose is around 65 to about 110, and this is also in grams per deciliter. So there's a few things that are notable about this. First, the way this diagram is organized, it's organized by cations, anions, labs reflecting kidney function, and then glucose. Now, as a nurse, you know, I learned these labs and I pretty much learned to just look at them in terms of looking at electrolyte values. So, you know, looking to evaluate a patient for hypo or hypernatremia or hypo or hyperkalemia, et cetera, um, I pretty much ignored the anions um, column. I'd look at BUN and, and creatinine for kidney function and I'd look at glucose. Um, but I, I want to point a few things out because the looking at the um, at both the cations and the anions can help us to calculate and understand the anion gap and give us some insight into what's going on with the acid base status. Now the first thing that I want to say before I get into more detail is that this CO2 is actually called total CO2 and it's made up of both the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood plus bicarbonate because most of our bicarbonate in the blood is actually uh, most of our carbon dioxide in the blood is actually being stored in the bicarbonate ion so this is like 95 percent of total CO2 so this CO2 here is actually a measure of bicarb and that's very important to recognize because that is key to understanding how the, these chemistries reflect what's going on with acid base in the, in the body because bicarbonate is the most important um, base in this in the serum in the extracellular space so for the purposes of this video I'm actually going to write in CO slash bicarbonate just so that that's why these are both anions. Chloride is an anion, bicarbonate is an anion, and so this is why this is the anion column. Okay, so let's talk about the anion gap. So to understand the anion gap, we need to remember that the law of 
electrical neutrality in the body. And um, basically what it says is that if we have if we have cations and anions that are dissolved in the blood that and they both have single charges um, the charges have to equal each other they have to balance each other out perfectly within the body so most of the ions in the body are single ions they are either have a single positive charge or a single negative charge so when we are looking at the balance between anions and cations we actually have to have the exact same milliequivalents per liter of um, so that we have an equal charge so the anions and the cations usually will the ones that we typically measure will come up to about 145 milli equivalents per liter all right so we would have 145 milli equivalents worth of cations 145 milli equivalents of anions and that would preserve our electrical neutrality okay so what happens though is so the major cat ion that we measure in serum is sodium and the other cat ion that we measure in serum is potassium So again, potassium is about three and a half to five or so milli equivalents, and the sodium is around 140. So together we've got we come up to our 145 milli equivalents per liter. Now with the anions, the most common anion in serum is the chloride anion. In chloride, we have about 104 or 105 milli equivalents per liter. And then the next most common is bicarbonate or as measured in the chemistry lab, total CO2. So According to the chemistries, right, we, we have sodium potassium in the cation column, and we have chloride and bicarbonate in the anion column. So what makes up the difference? If we add, added chloride of 105, and we added a bicarbonate ion of about 25, then we end up with with 130. We're missing about 12 to 15 or so milliequivalents per liter. So this here represents the anion gap. Now, I know I just told you that this has to be neutral. So what does the anion gap mean? Well, it means that there are a significant amount, 15 or 16 milli equivalents per liter, that represents unmeasured anions. So what are those unmeasured anions? So the unmeasured anions are acids. We have, you know, many acids in the body that, um, that can cause an acidosis. And this is lactic acid, which is an acid that occurs um, through the, through anaerobic metabolism or builds up in, with anaerobic metabolism. Keto acids or ketones, and these are byproducts of the metabolism of lipids, uric acid or uremia, and then endogenous acids or acids that come from outside of the body, which are essentially toxins. So this anion gap is explained by 
commonly by these acids. Now, this is only in the case when we have an acidosis. So if we have an ABG, that shows that we have a pH that's less than 7.35. We know we have an acidosis. And then if we look at our chemistry labs, and we realize that when we add up our potassium and our sodium, and it, we come up to around 145 mil equivalents, and then we add up our chloride and our total CO2 or bicarbonate, and we only come up with, say, 115, then that suggests that we have a high gap acidosis. If we have a pH of, seven, of less than 7.35, and we look at the anion gap, if we take our sodium and potassium, add it together and subtract our chloride and CO2, and we end up with an anion gap that's 16 mil equivalents or less, then it is non-gap. Now, I want to point one thing out, though. There are actually two different ways to measure an anion gap. One is to just look at the, the sodium and not include the potassium. And if we do that, then our, we're only, if we're only looking at sodium and not including our potassium, the, the normal anion gap will be 12, 12 milliequivalents per liter or less. If we are including potassium, then it will be 16 milliequivalents or less. So a high gap would be greater than 12 milliequivalents for sodium only. or 16 milliequivalents per liter if K is included. Okay, so that's all you need to know to learn how to interpret basic chemistries and calculate an anion gap. That's it for our lesson today. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to please like and subscribe below.